Okay, Lamar's going to throw the ball in over to the Devin Williams. Devin Williams over to Michael Manette. Michael looks over to Devin. Devin fakes a little bit. Shake and bake. Here we go. Oh! Devin Williams! Oh, my goodness. Welcome back, everybody, to New Mexico is a Basketball State podcast. I'm Russell Lee Goulet, your host, and this is the 17th episode already, and uh, we're already, uh, in, wow, it's been uh, over a year now of episodes, so this is pretty awesome what's going on here. Uh, it's great to be back. I'm going to go over a lot of stuff today, a little bit. Uh, has happened since the season has ended. Uh, we've had quite a few team tournament camps and there's been a lot of great competition. Some people have stood out, so that's been awesome. And uh, I'm going to go over that real quick. Uh, a little bit of news. Uh, Clovis head coach Jaden Isler, Isler, or Isler has stepped down. He is taking a position over in Texas, so that's exciting for him. So it'll be interesting to see who they hire over at Clovis uh, over there in eastern New Mexico. So that's exciting. And uh, we've also had some other hires, such as Leroy Barella of uh, Albuquerque High. Now that's uh, going to be interesting, and they need a lot of uh, excitement over there to get that place going. But uh, first of all, let's let's go into uh, Section 7, the uh, high school tournament that was held in Phoenix, Arizona about two weeks ago, and I was there. And I got to check it out a uh, second year in a row and uh, got to document everything. We had five teams over there. We had La Cueva, Volcano Vista, Highland, Sandia, and Cleveland. And uh, let me tell you, I, I worked. I, I definitely ended up working over there for sure. Uh, when I got there, I had a whole day to travel and I got there. And then the next day I showed up at about nine o'clock at State Farm Stadium where the Arizona Cardinals play. There from nine o'clock all the way to about, I didn't get out of there till 11 o'clock at night. And I was at the Jack in the Box at 12 midnight there in uh, Arizona looking for food. And it was a long, long day. There were a lot of college coaches there. I saw UCLA's coaches there, Mick Cronin, and I saw a few others. I saw a uh, Lobo assistant coach or two there. And uh, so it was very exciting. You also, there was also a lot of small college, Northern Colorado, Eastern New Mexico. Quite a few people were there. A lot of people who looked familiar to me, but I couldn't place the name. But there was definitely a lot of them and a lot of uh, parents out there watching their sons play. And so that was exciting. And uh, there was a few uh, bright performances. La Cueva went 3-1 and one in the, this tournament. And uh, that was against... Nevada teams, Arizona, California, uh, you had um, Washington there, I believe, also. So they did very well there at Section 7. Highland also did very well playing there against some Arizona teams. They beat a few Arizona teams, so that was impressive. Volcano Vista was playing some very tough teams from Nevada that play with v Bishop Gorman and people like that. And uh, Sandia was also playing some tough competition too. Cleveland also had a few tough, uh, tough teams to play against, such as Jordan, Utah, uh, teams of that nature. And they, and they did fairly well. Uh, they, I think they all kind of broke out even. And all in all, it was a great tournament, a lot of looks, uh, a few players stood out. Alexis Dominguez of Highland uh, really ran his ball club well, and they showed that they had a, a lot of shooters. They showed uh, some new faces, Ishi Herrera, and uh, there was also... Um, Jose Liscon, I believe is his name, and uh, Fernando Hernandez was tough in the paint, and uh, the, they showed that they could really shoot outside, and they might be the best shooting team outside this coming season, so that's going to be something to look out for. Instead of last year of just throwing the ball into Jose Murillo, this year it's going to be a lot of outside shots. Cleveland uh, looked pretty good with a uh, Daniel Steverson leading the way. He was very aggressive. He was uh, always taking it to the rim, and he looked nice on a lot of finishes. And so I'm sure he turned a few heads there at Section 7. Josiah Ortiz also looked pretty tough in the paint, and he made a few plays. And then freshman Remy Albrecht, I hope I'm saying his name right. Uh, he's a new one on the block. Nice shooter from outside. And uh, he looked gr aggressive. And it looks like uh, Coach Sean Jimenez is going to hand him the keys to the offense there to run the offense for the Storm. 
Now, Sandia, Sandia looks very athletic, and they got a few nice young players. Thomas Adams coming into the fold. You have Andrew Hill, who uh, looks to be uh, moving up a level. And you have Eli Lovato, and you got Lamarian Coleman, who was looking nice from outside. So this is an athletic team, and uh, they, they look really exciting when they're in rhythm. And uh, so when they don't get in rhythm, they don't. They struggle. They really do. They struggle. But if they can work these things out, they're going to be a tough team to uh, compete against. And I expect them in the state tournament next season. So definitely be on the lookout for them uh, next season with that team. Now, you have La Cueva. And La Cueva is... Um, look stacked they look loaded they have outside sh shooting they have uh, inside play with daniel jacobson and they have paul lovato who's coming into the mix and uh, he's going to be a kind of a catalyst for them because he's going to get a lot of those buckets and clean up the boards you have Exodus Ayers, who looks like he's going to uh, lead that offense and really, really be the aggressor this coming season. So look out for him. I think he's going to have a breakout season. Sidarius Aits is going to be there also. You have Jojo Goliford. He's going to be very, uh, very good from outside. And uh, they have Isaiah Daniclaw, who's going to also be another great outside shooter. So they can get you from outside and inside. La Cueva, to me, is looking like uh, maybe possibly the best team in the state as of right now because they did go three and one at section seven against some tough competition uh, one team they played was in out of denver colorado and they beat them uh, rather rather uh, handily so this is a team that we're gonna have to keep an eye on for sure la cueva looks to be the preseason number one now volcano will have something to say about that volcano Played some tough competition, and the duel of Kenyon Aguino and Sean Alter looks to be uh, very solid, very difficult to handle. It'll be the guard play that's going to have to step up for them from the outside. That's uh, where they lost a lot of players from last year due to graduation. So you're going to have to you're going to have to just kind of wait and see. That's how I'm taking this, is looking at Volcano Vistas, wait and see how their guard play does. If their guard play is rises up to a level and matures, you're looking at one and two, La Cueva and Volcano Vista right now. But I got to mention another team that wasn't at Section 7, and that's Alamogordo. Alamogordo is looking... Um, very, very intriguing. They have uh, Kai Bickham and they have Deontay Bynum at the guards. And Kai Bickham is a, is a great outside shooter. They have Etruvon Sanders, who uh, just went to Jay Bilas' uh, ca team camp or uh, personal skills camp. And so that's an impressive invite for him. And he comes in at 6'3". They have Tristan Drake at 6'9". And so they got the paint covered right there. But from what I understand, they have Mayfield transfer Devian Smith, who averaged 12 points a game last season for the Trojans. Now he's from Alamogordo, and it looks like they might let him play this season. He is 6'4", and uh, he's going to be a great addition for the Tigers of Alamogordo. So this team looks like it's going to be stacked. It looks like this team is top five in the state right now. And it looks like they can definitely wheel off 20 wins. Now, they only won 13 games last season. They were all sophomores. This year, they're all going to be juniors. And with Devian Smith, he's going to be a senior. And if he's allowed to play, which I believe he's going to, they're going to be very, very tough to beat. i got to tell you, they're going to be interesting. They're going to give... Uh, you know, the Lo Cuevas and the Volcano Vistas are running for their money. They all have height. They're all stacked. Sean Alter of Volcano Vista is 6'8". Kenyon Agueno, he is 6'6". Six, six. You go to La Cueva, you got Paul Lovato is 6'6". Six, six. You got 6'10", Daniel Jacobson. And they're all tall and they can all cover the paint. And that's the most important thing is having those guys who can handle the paint. That's what makes difficult mismatches all over the place as far as the state tournament and when those things come. Now, moving from Section 7, and I got to tell you, you know, just my own personal experiences from Section 7. I'll just go through this real quick because I, I like to try to get through the teams and the players real quick and give you that kind of info. 
Section 7 was a lot of fun, but this year it seems like it got a lot more corporate. Uh, they, they wanted us to put their logo on everything and uh, they wanted us to tag them on everything. This was the Section 7 media people. And they waited to tell us to do this two days before the tournament started. So if you didn't agree with that, if you weren't willing to give them free advertising, which is what it was, then uh, you were kind of screwed because you couldn't really back out at the last minute because you'd already made hotel reservations, uh, flights, and things like that. So Section 7, I think, is probably going to get a little more corporate next year, and I hope it doesn't because it's a great event that's put on by the Arizona Coaches Association. But now the Fiesta Bowl's involved, so we'll see. It's probably going to get a little more corporate. We'll see what happens. Uh, I don't know how that's going to affect New Mexico schools, but we did have a good showing there. And uh, that hopefully will give us some consideration for some more invites next season. So hopefully instead of five this year, we get six next year. And that will be exciting to happen. And uh, I personally got attached to that stadium because I spent like 20 hours in that place. And so I missed the big stadium, the big rattlesnake, I guess is what you would call it, because it looks like a rattlesnake from outside. And it's a nice area, and uh, there was a lot of fun. And uh, it was a different scene altogether as far as Arizona is concerned. You didn't see a face covering anywhere, okay? It's like that thing, the thing all but disappeared there. They, everybody's moved on over there in Arizona, that's for sure. You, you can definitely tell. You have to really, really hunt for face covering in that place. And I don't think you're going to find one, to be honest with you. And so that is uh, that was an exciting experience. I hope to go to some more tournaments. The live period is going on now in AAU ball. So we're going to see if there's some more offers. But to get back to the teams that I think are going to do well next season, uh, after seeing some of the team camps besides Section 7, um, I'm thinking Academy is going to do really well this year. They have Joe Jack, who's going to be an exciting player to watch this coming season. Joe Jack uh, is got, definitely going to lead the Chargers. They got some mojo going on. They're excited. Shout out to Coach Jake Heron. That was a school that, to be honest with you, I didn't really want to see couple years ago I didn't want to go to any of their games because it was rough to watch it really was I'm going to be honest it was rough to watch it's like oh it's academy I don't know if I want to go there but they have gotten some energy they have really worked on the fundamentals they have definitely played harder on defense and he's turned that program around and it's evident considering what they did in the state tournament last year St. Pius is another school that's looking really good. I believe they won the Mark Adams team camp, which is Texas Tech. They went over there and they did really well. Brian Cobb uh, at 6'7", who's showing all kinds of skill from mid-range game to outside to scoring inside. He, uh, he's really standing out and he's going to definitely be another player to watch besides Joe Jack of Academy there in 4A. So things are shipping up. It, it, they're, ship, they're shaping out a little bit. We're getting an ideal. Artesia was another one at the team camps that looked good. Nick Sanchez at 5'9". Possibly one of the state's best point guards along with uh, Alexis Dominguez. These guys are all going to duke it out. They're, we're going to see some nice, nice guard play and some nice outside shooting from these people. And so that's exciting. And moving on to like 5A, you still I talked about Alamogordo, La Cueva, and Volcano Vista and how they did at the uh, Section 7, but here in the state, you've got Las Cruces, who's not really depleted. They look tough. They look like they could win 20 games with Caleb Carr at 6'9", another big man. In fact, that matchup between Alamogordo and Las Cruces could be a really big one. That should be really exciting to watch, and I'm going to make it a point to get down there and watch something like that. I want to see how that plays out, because they also have David Cruz, they have Suge Velez, who's a uh, great outside shooters tough on defense Joe Koning is a 6-4 for the Bulldogs and he should be a, a nice compliment to Caleb Carr and they got some young athletes who look like 
they're ready to step in and continue the tradition over there at Las Cruces. So Coach William Benjamin has a really nice group going on there. You have Oregon Mountain with Lenny Washington, and you have Brandon Quirez, who I understand is doing really, really well on the AAU circuit. And uh, that team right there is intriguing. And if they can put things together, they can definitely make a run at uh, you know the state tournament and getting a berth. You also have... You also have Mayfield with AC Munoz, who might be one of the better shooters from outside, one of the better gunslingers from outside. And uh, that Mayfield Trojan team with new head coach, well, he's now officially head coach, Keith Roberts. Uh, he's a former uh, assistant at New Mexico State. And I think it's exciting what he might be able to do over there at Mayfield. So definitely keep an eye on it uh, down there in Las Cruces because a lot of those schools are really rising to the level of being very, very competitive because there's a lot of players that are getting better and better and getting noticed, especially on the AAU scene. So that is really exciting. Damning, I gotta mention Damning, Alex Alfaro. Alex Alfaro, I just don't have much tape on him, but he's a hidden gem. Hidden gem. He averaged 15 points a game and 12 rebounds a game, okay? I just don't even know how tall he is. I know what he looks like, but He's definitely one that's under the radar, and I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on. So that whole district in uh, Las Cruces, Demi Namalu Magordo in that area, looks to be a real war next season. And that's going to be exciting because it's kind of hard to tell who might win that thing. It looks like Alan Magordo might be the team to do it because they got the size and they've got the shooting and they got the point guard play. So we'll have to sit back and see what happens, but I'm thinking they're going to do it. And we'll, I'm thinking Las Cruces, and then I'm thinking Oregon Mountain and maybe Mayfield and then Deming. We'll see how that all plays out. Here in the Metro, you've got a Trisco who is probably going to be one of the... Uh, faster teams out there and this team is another top five team in the state in my opinion you have chris parra latavius morris you have marquise renfo and then you have tony pacheco so we'll see who they add next to that group and how they are all complementing each other it looks like they're going to be a fast run and gun team they had a nice win over hobbs they were able to escape hobbs and ralph tasker last season and so that's a good sign and a good jumping point for them for this season and so with that we got to move on to manzano Manzano has got new, new energy. They were a program. They were like a ship with no anchor out at sea. Now they've got young Nick Dial, who's going to be a senior at 6'4". And, and this guy, might, I think he might play himself right into my top 10, to be honest with you, because I'm excited about him. He's long, he's lean, he's fast, he's great at defense. He can throw it down and he can shoot outside. They have Armando Cepeda, a nice lefty who's showing some nice moves and he's getting to the basket and getting scores. Wilson Bonnet, who's also getting rebounds and doing well inside. This team has got a lot of energy. They got a lot of fire. They, uh, they seem excited to play. And that's what uh, you're looking for as far as teams. And so they're doing this in the summer and they're winning some games. So they're definitely a team to watch for next season as far as things are going. That's what it's looking like. Manzano could be a, a contender as far as district play. And they might be able to get a state tournament berth. You have El Dorado. You have Caleb Parham, who's a great athlete at 6'2". And you have Michael uh, Michael Knob, and then you have Josh Jackson, who's showing a little bit of an outside shot. So this El Dorado Eagles team is intriguing, and Coach Sanchez uh, looks to have something to definitely work with. Caleb Parham at six uh, two, he's he's one of these guys that's a high leaper, athletic, uh, gets involved in the play, can get to the rim, shoot outside. Michael Knob is another one with a mid range game, can shoot outside, and so they got some guys who can uh, be definite threats and score so this is another team that is definitely going to be there in the hunt for a state berth and uh, so we move on and uh, I look through you know the the city and see how everything is going you have uh, Jonah Lopez of Rio Grande he might be another hidden gem we'll have to see how he does we'll have to see I'll have to just kind of wait and see but I think he's going to be another one that is going to stand out a little bit and we'll see if he can uh, 
get some mojo going there at Rio Grande for the Ravens. And uh, as we go through, Valley, Valley has some intriguing pieces. They're going to possibly play the same style they did last year. So that's exciting. And we'll see how they do in 4A. You have Del Norte with Shane Doma Sanchez, who is just at Pangos, and he's beginning to stand out, and I suspect he's going to start getting some offers, hopefully. He should. He's definitely a really skilled player and really doing well. Now, it's it's kind of disappointing. They, they were kind of decimated by ABC Prep, basically. Uh, you had Harrison Frank leave, and you had uh, Judah Casas leave. So... It's going to be Shane's show, and we'll see who else can step in. I, Harrison Frank probably should have stayed. He would have gotten a lot of shots, in my opinion. But uh, I can't count Del Norte out. McIntosh, Coach McIntosh, does a, a really nice job over there, a really good job. Already got one state title under his belt. We'll see how they, uh, how they put this all together, and uh, we'll see what they can do with uh, the roster that they have now. So I'm going to keep an eye on them for sure. You got Hope. Christian. Uh, Coach Murphy, you can never count him out. You got Jet Wyckoff, and uh, you've got a group that already looks like they're in sync. They already look in sync from what I saw at the uh, New Mexico Games Tournament. They looked pretty good over there. And I'm going to see how they play out. They're, it's going to be a team thing over there at Hope Christian this year. And Jet Wyckoff uh, looks to be shooting really well from outside. And he's another one of the state's top shooters. He's up there with, uh, with A.C. Munoz of Mayfield and uh, David Cruz of Las Cruces. And uh, I also, Isaiah Maldonado of Albuquerque High. We got some really nice shooters out there this year. And I think it's going to be a lot of bombs away this year in New Mexico high school basketball. You also have, uh, you know, sticking with 4A, because I'm bouncing around a little bit, so just keep up with me, because I uh, only have so many minutes, right? You got Julian Arroyo, who's really beginning to stand out this year in summer ball. He's shooting really well for Lovington, so that's intriguing to see. You also have, um, let's go through 4A some more here. You got Nico Garcia of Los Alamos, who's really, he's getting bigger and stronger, and he's standing out a little bit. So... With that, all of, all of this is going on. There's still more information to gather, and uh, there's still more to do. But the one player that I think is standing out the most and is really, really moving on up the ladder, and this is a guy that uh, I think you're going to start calling him a four-star recruit pretty soon. If he's not a three-star, I'm surprised, but he, he's probably already there a three-star, but he's going to be a four-star before we're done here. And that's Los Lunas Jalen Holland. Jalen Holland at 6'4 has been getting better and better. And he's getting more and more rhythmic and fluid out there. And he's getting even more and more attention. He's already got 3D1 offers from Southern Utah, New Mexico State, and New Mexico. But I'm saying he's going to get the big time offers. And I'm not saying New Mexico and New Mexico State aren't big time, but they're mid. Let's be honest, they're mid major, okay? We'll use that term that the media coins for these schools, mid major. I'm saying that uh, Jalen Holland will start attracting the attention of these big power five schools like your like your Colorados, your your Oklahomas, your Texas, people like that. I'm saying he's going to start attracting that kind of attention. We're going to start seeing them start to visit Los Lunas and take that drive down I-25. That's where I'm seeing this going little by little. That's, that's where I'm seeing it. And so that's going to be exciting next year. It's going to be Jalen Holland's world and we're just going to live in it. That's, that's the feeling I'm getting because the, the, last, the last clips I've seen, he's just gotten better and better and smoother. And he's taking more chances out there. And that's a good thing when you take chances. And so that's kind of a recap of, of everything that's going on. I understand Bernalillo hired a new coach. I don't have his name as of yet. You probably already know his name. I just haven't been able to gather that information in time. And so I'm going through my mind here to see if I've missed anybody or anything like that. It looks to me like uh, that's kind of the gist of things as of right now. Oh, yes, Farmington. Farmington, Cody Vasserstein 
is doing well from what I understand and uh, Farmington is another group that's intriguing right now and of course Santa Fe and Capitol are in that district too and so well I'll just have to see how that plays out I got to go to more camps okay I haven't seen everybody play that's that's the difficulty of it and yes Wes Mesa I'm sure you're waiting for me to say something about you and here I am Brandon Lagunas, he's another great point guard out there in the state. It's going to be the year of the point guard, it looks like. And you have Sonny Ortiz at 6'4". And you also have Elijah Brody. Elijah Brody, that's other big news that came through from uh, Cleveland. He transferred over and he's coming over to West Mesa. And so West Mesa is another team that's going to be in the hunt. Now we'll see how they react, how they play, and how they're going to do. That's, that's just all it is to it right now. We'll see what they can do, but I think they're another team that can get a state berth. Rio Rancho is another team with Jaden Johnson. Jaden's going to have to grab the ball by the horn, bull by the horns, and, and uh, really step out there if he wants to get noticed because he's a really good player. He's got the athleticism. He's got the size. He's got the talent. So we'll see how he leads the Rams. He's going to have to do it. That's, that's that simple. That's my message to him. Cleveland... Uh, you know, like I said earlier, he's got a nice group. And uh, going through all of them, Roswell's another one that's intriguing right now. Hobbs. Hobbs is another team that did well at the Mark Adams camp in Texas Tech. But we're just going to have to see uh, how this plays out. And it's, it's going to be the first five or ten games of the season to really know where things are going to go. But as far as team camp play and stuff, a lot of teams are looking good right now. And it's looking like we're going to have a lot of outside shooting this year. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to move on to that, the next take, okay? I hope I've covered everybody. There's a lot to cover there in, in a little bit of time. But the next take, a lot of people ask me my opinion on the player of the year, the Gatorade player of the year, and the, the state championship game. And I hadn't really put too much thought into it i had a few opinions but that was about it but i put some thought into it and i'm going to give you my take on the state championship game 5a volcano vista versus las cruces i'm going to give you a, a more thorough take on it uh, i'm going to give you my opinions on on how the media handled that situation how, how they handled that game that coverage I honestly wasn't too happy about it, and I'm going to give you the reasons why. The Gatorade Player of the Year uh, Award, uh, there's some controversy there, because uh, I, I can say that I'm getting messages. Okay, I'm getting messages on it. So I'm going to give you my take on who I thought should be the Gatorade Player of the Year. All right, so stay tuned for that next take, all right? Thank you. All right, now we're going to get on to uh, my... Uh my take, my thoughts on the Gatorade Player of the Year and uh, the state championship game 5A between Las Cruces and Volcano Vista. Now, a lot of people had messaged me and asked me my thoughts. I hadn't really thought about it that much because uh, I was busy with summer. So I'm going to give you uh, basically my thoughts on all of this and uh, if I had had a vote. You know, when I looked at the state championship game, it was everything you could hope for. You had two undefeated teams. They were all together, and uh, they met at one perfect time. And I thought it was a great game overall, especially when it went to overtime. And it was, it was, it was just uh, one to talk about for the ages. There were several things, though, that, that were frustrating and irritating for me personally is uh, the post play. The post play was really irritating for me, uh, the way it was managed by the referee crew. Now, you had a college ref and you had two uh, other refs from different locations from around the state. And what they did is they put them together and uh, they, they didn't really grab control of the uh, post play because they were not allowing post players to get in position a legal position according to the rule book they weren't really allowing that to happen the uh the post player the uh, offensive player was dispensed over and over again that's their legal term in the rule books and uh, isaiah carr when you looked at him he had a heck of a time just being able to establish position because he was constantly 
dispensed according to the rule book. And uh, a lot of times that should be called a block. It was not called. And frankly, I was kind of stunned that Sean Alter of Volcano Vista didn't foul out of the game because there was so much of that. And, um, and so I thought that that was not called very properly at all. I thought that uh, basically Isaiah Carr got mugged in that game yet he somehow came out with 15 points and 17 rebounds and i don't know how many blocks but the thing was is that the refs it seemed like the two uh two refs kept deferring to the college ref and he wasn't grabbing control of the game and getting a rhythm they should all be on one team there as far as refereeing the game and how it's going to be played and and frankly it looked like the uh the the 1990 new york knicks under pat riley to be honest with you uh, that team is the reason people play the game the way they do now and here's the thing about all of that is that there was so much physical play. I hadn't seen that much physical play in a state championship game in forever. And I watch about 70 games a year of high school basketball. And most of those, uh, most of those games, uh, a lot of the things that happened in that post play would have been called as fouls against the defensive player or the offensive player. And so with that, it was not... I was, I, I was just really irritated with it. I thought it was just not very well officiated in that aspect of the game. Uh, another thing I had mentioned in another uh, podcast was the technical foul before the game. And it was due to somebody dunking in warm-ups. And I thought that uh, I looked up the rule and the NCAA got rid of it seven years ago. The, uh, NBA, FIBA, everybody else has gotten rid of this rule. But high school basketball wants to hold on to it. It's like the purest... High school basketball is the purest last hope. If you, the purists had their way, we'd be playing the, the game back in the 50s and people would be shooting two-hand set shots, to be honest with you. And the thing about all of it is that it just holds the game back. And I don't think it needed to be there. And it's kind of frustrating that that would come into play in a state championship game. Because you got one team getting two points at the free throw line without the ball ever being tipped. And I honestly didn't see who dunked. I think a lot of people were wondering, well, why, why are they shooting two free throws? Oh, because there was a technical foul called before the game. Here's another interesting aspect to all that. Is that that technical foul is assessed to the Las Cruces coach, William Benjamin. Okay, so he can't really say anything more to the referees because they could call another technical foul and then he's ejected from the game. He's already down before he even gets started. And so that's one reason why I don't like that rule. And I'd be arguing against it if it happened to Volcano Vista. Anybody, a Trisco, whatever, Santa Fe, it doesn't matter. I'd be arguing the same thing. It, there's already rules in place to deal with situations before the game. It doesn't need to be in the rule book anymore, in my opinion. It's a sacred cow. The, uh, the thing else uh, that, you know, as far as the game, the one thing that I think was missed a lot by the Albuquerque media, especially, was Kenyon Agueno's performance. Volcano Vista's Kenyon Agueno hit a lot of big threes, and he also hit some inside points. And he's a freshman at that time in that game, and he's a big, big reason why they won. He's a big reason they were able to get the lead and maintain it. He's huge. He's huge in that game. You know, when you come down to it, you would say probably make Kenyon Agueno the player of the game if there was going to be a player of the game. You would make him the player of the game because he's a big reason they were able to get the lead. He played huge. He was huge in that game. And he was barely mentioned. It was, it was amazing that he was barely mentioned. But he did such a great job there as far as his shooting and everything else is concerned. And um, so... It was, it was kind of, those were the things that kind of irked me about all of it. Uh, some of the Twitter talk kind of irked me because uh, I think it lacked substance. I think it lacked knowledge. You know, uh, you have the journal reporter running to Twitter to try to uh, claim that Isaiah Carr went over the back all the time, which I thought was silly and non nonsensical, to be honest with you. Because I only saw it once, and, and that was basically because the, the guy boxing out was down below his knees practically, you know, and practically falling over. 
and, and that's a little trick you coaches can use. Just get a short guy on a tall guy and have him box out and box out below his knees and you'll get an over the back all day long because the, uh, the tall guy is going to end up falling over his back. Yeah, oh, over the back. Whoop, blow the whistle. Easy. It's an easy call. It's, it's something needs to be addressed with it because really when it gets to that point, it should be a blocking call. But that's, that's my take on it. And uh, so that was kind of annoying to me, the lack of uh, substance in those tweets. And so it, it, it made for a very kind of uh, surreal night in a way. And uh, it was impressive how Las Cruces was able to overcome all that adversity. And it was impressive how Jaquan Hill was able to hit those two free throws and send it to overtime. But you know what? It, Las Cruces almost won that game. It was it was it was very impressive. You leading the game with four seconds to go after all of that. It was very impressive to me. I mean that really stood out to me because it looked like they were dead in the water for quite a long time, and Volcano Vista was going to walk away with this. And so, you know, and then by the by overtime, Isaiah Carr fouls out, and then uh, you know some of Volcano Vista's players scored their first points. And, uh, and uh, that's testament to being Kenyon and Guano stepping up, you know, because the other guys didn't do as well as, as he did. He was the, the other guys on Volcano Vista squad didn't really get the points that were needed. It was, it was Kenyon and Guano that did it. He was the big factor in that game for them. And so kudos to Volcano Vista for winning the state championship because it was a very difficult game for sure. And, uh, and another thing that bothered me about the game, there were two other aspects to it that bothered me was the press conference. Uh, you know, professional journalists are over here hugging the Volcano Vista coach after the press conference. And all I got to ask is if Las Cruces had, run, had won, would they have done the same thing? Would they have hugged the Las Cruces coach? I'm just asking a question, okay? You know, these are people that are paid journalists. I'm not, but they are. Therefore, they're professional. They got the little title professional. And you read them. Would they have hugged the Las Cruces coach? I'm just asking a question, okay? Is that ethical to you? Is that ethical? To me, it's not. I don't think it's very ethical. But that's just me. Uh, another thing about the state tournament game. At the end, uh, crowd control. I, uh, I was sitting by the Volcano Vista student section and normally I don't have a problem with people rushing the court. I've been there with Valley or Trisco and others have done it. It's, uh, it's when the railings get torn down and there's no security there. And then you have all these kids literally kind of stum potentially stumbling over each other. It could have been bad, okay? It could have been really bad. Somebody could have gotten hurt. Somebody could have broken an arm, a leg, or anything, a wrist. It was, uh, was kind of scary. I actually, what kind of annoyed me is I grabbed my camera bag because I, uh, I had a feeling that it was going to get stepped on, to be honest. It wasn't going to be respected. And so that's why I grabbed it because it just seemed like it was totally out of control the way that rush the court was. There was only one event staffer there and he got out of the way. There's nothing he could do. But the railings were torn down and so it was very, uh, very tedious and awkward. Uh, uh, there was nowhere to really step, but you got all these kids stepping over this and it takes just one person and then another person and then another person and then you have a snowball effect and it gets really dangerous. And then uh, seeing the floor get trashed like it did, I wasn't too happy about that. You know, I, uh, you got popcorn and Coke and stuff all over the floor. And I wasn't really happy with that. And so that I think needs to be addressed next season somehow, some way. <coughs> so, you know, that's, that's, that's my response to a lot of people who've messaged me. And so uh, that's my response to people who, uh, who may have not seen some of the things I did. Now, as far as the Gatorade Player of the Year is concerned, you know, you've asked me, people have asked me about that. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to break it down. I didn't really think about it. And then I started breaking it down and looking at it. Duquan Hill, Volcano Vista won the Gatorade Player of the Year. Max Preps awarded William Deuce Benjamin of Las Cruces the Player of the Year. New Mexico Preps gave William Deuce Benjamin of Las Cruces Mr. Basketball. 
Now, I looked at it, and I believe that a player of the year is exactly what it means. A whole body of work for the whole year. For the whole year, okay? A whole body of work. That's how I look at it. That's how I would determine it if I had a vote. That was how it would be. So, with that, I looked at William Deuce Benjamin, Jaquan Hill, Jose Murillo, and I even looked at Isaiah Carr because stats, stats, they play a big role. They mean something. You could kind of twist them as much as you want, but in the end, they still tell the truth. They matter. You look at a LeBron, Michael Jordan discussion, GOAT discussion, it's always stats. It's always stats, and they're put into context. The thing is, is that when you look at William Deuce Benjamin's stats, he was top five in the state of New Mexico at 25.2 points a game, led an assist at 6.9. He led an assist, okay? So he's top five in two categories. All he needed was like a 30, 40 point game, and he could have easily been number two or number three in scoring in the state of New Mexico. Bruce, uh, Bruce Bowen Jr. won, uh, led at 27 points a game for, he plays for the New Mexico School of the Deaf. Okay, great player, uh, great person. The thing is, is that you look at Jose Murillo, he averaged 23 points a game, 10 plus rebounds a game, 2.9 blocks. Isaiah Carr came in there at 18. He also had 10 points, uh, 10 rebounds a game, and he also had three blocks a game. He led the state in blocks. You, uh, you look at Jaquan Hill, he's down at 16.7 points a game. He's literally dwarfed by the other three, literally. Now, well, Isaiah Carr is the closest if you want to get real technical. The thing is, is that stats-wise, Jaquan Hill, who won the Gatorade Player of the Year, is dwarfed by William Deuce Benjamin. By a lot. By a lot. Even Jose Murillo dwarfs, uh, dwarfs Jaquan Hill. I mean, you can't, it's facts. You can't get around it. You cannot, you can take all the emotion out of it. You don't have to be a Volcano Vista fan or a Las Cruces fan to say, hey, look, you know what? William Deuce Benjamin, Jose Murillo, and even Isaiah Carr all have better stats than Jaquan Hill. There's no way around it, okay? It's just there. It's this there. That's how you decide it, right? Well, people will say, team. Team, okay. Well, they all made the state championship final. So obviously, team is one factor, but they all made the state championship final in 4A and 5A, okay? So... Do you pick the state championship performance as your reason to give them player of the year, which is a whole body of work? Or do you just go by the whole year's body of work, okay? If you're going to pick one game to determine all that, well then Jose Murillo, because he had 40 points a game, 20 rebounds. He had a game that even... They say it was for the ages, right? Uh, it was for the ages. What? 40 points, 20 rebounds. So if it's one game, then Jose Murillo, right? Player of the year, right? That's okay. Well, if you want to look at strength of schedule, okay? You look at Las Cruces. Six of the top 10 teams in 5A, according to Max Preps, all these teams had 20 wins. And that's including Volcano Vista. Las Cruces played. Las Cruces played six of the top 10 teams in 5A, according to Max Preps, and that's including Las Volcano Vista, okay? They also, you can also include Chapman High School, who's ranked number eighth in 5A. That's out of 300 schools. That's 300 schools to pick from to pick your top 10 in, Texan, in Texas. A lot of Texans, that's a lot of work. But that's 300 schools to pick from, and they picked Chapin as number 8 at the beginning of the year in 5A in Texas. And that team, I believe, went to the Sweet 16 in Texas, okay? Las Cruces beat them. So you could say that Las Cruces played seven, seven top 10 teams in New Mexico and Texas. That's just the facts, okay? Now you look at Volcano Vista. Volcano Vista played six of the top 10 teams in New Mexico, and that's including 
Las Cruces. Okay? You could say that. That's a fact. So they kind of balance each other out. All right? It's not much difference right there. You, uh, you could say that, okay, Volcano Vista played at Trisco a bunch of times in the regular season. And so that should put them over the top, right? Well, you could argue that Atrisco lost his coach in the middle of the season. He retired to go to APS. They lost the top player in Chris Parra for quite a few games, and they were basically kind of dead in the water. They didn't start playing well until the state tournament when they got everything back and they got a coach who was going to be officially their head coach. You could argue that, okay? So that kind of negates everything a little bit, all right? You can look at all of that. You could look at Highland. Highland only lost to three top 10 teams in 5A, one or two. And uh, they played basically all the top 10 teams in 4A and they won. So team-wise, they all made the state final. They all had tough records. They all played top 10 teams in their respective classes. Las Cruces, you could argue, played top 10 teams in Texas and New Mexico, and they won, okay? So team factor doesn't play quite as much because the records stand for themselves. So you look at the stats. Well, Deuce Benjamin has big stats and top five in scoring and top five. He's number one in assist in the whole state. You look at Jose Murillo. He's up there in scoring. He's pretty kind of right there behind Deuce, and he's also in rebounding. He's also there in block shots. So you could argue for Jose Murillo. You could. But how do you separate it? Okay, we could go back to uh, last game shots, right? Okay, let's go back to last game shots. William Deuce Benjamin beats Chapman with two free throws against them. Okay, and they win by one. And that's the number eight team in 5A Texas, okay? You got Jaquan Hill. He beats La Cueva. Hits two buckets, hits a 30-footer. They beat La Cueva, top 10 team in New Mexico, okay? And then he, uh, he gets two free throws and send it to overtime. That's not really... You could say he kept them from losing, but that didn't win the game. There's still five more minutes to play. You see where I'm getting at? That didn't win the game, so to speak. It just gave them five more minutes to play, okay? That's what you could really say, to be honest. So when you break it all down, it looks to me like stats is, is what's going to carry William Deuce over if I had to vote. Because Las Cruces, you could argue, played a tougher schedule than Highland, okay? And you could say that it was pretty much even against Volcano Vista. So in a year's worth of work, you could say that William Deuce Benjamin did it all and dominated. And you could say that with all of that, the only thing that holds up to Quan is, is being undefeated. But if you ask the question, okay, if Volcano Vista had lost... Is Jaquan Hill the player of the year? Gatorade player of the year? Do you even give him a vote? I mean, honestly, think about that. Do you even give him a vote if they had lost? Okay? So if it's just one game and that's what you're voting on, Gatorade player of the year voters, then what is it? Is it something else? What is it? Because when you break it all down, it looks like William Deuce wins in pretty much every category and Jose is very close. It's only strength of schedule that really kind of pulls Las Cruces over Highland when you really look at it. And if you're not really looking at everything, if you're not really counting just one game as a reason to give one guy a player of the game, that's the way I look at it, then it's William Deuce. You could also argue that he was behind by 10 points. Las Cruces behind by 10 points the whole state championship game, and yet they have the lead with four seconds to go in regulation. You can argue that. I mean, to me, if I had to vote, it would have been William Deuce Benjamin by hair over Jose Murillo. 
it was that close. You probably had to do papers, rock, scissors, or flip a coin a couple times. For me, anyways, okay? Because Jose Murillo puts up great stats. I don't see how you can even, and you can say Isaiah Carr, too, had really good stats, and, and there could be a few sentences for him as far as the discussion of player of the year. I just don't see how you can give Jaquan Hill player of the year, player of the year with those stats. It's just not enough. And I'm not saying he isn't good enough to be a player of the year. He's definitely got the talent to be a player of the year. But in this year, I just don't think it's enough to overcome Jose Murillo and William Deuce Benjamin. And it might not even be enough to overcome Isaiah Carr, to be honest with you. Okay? That's, that's kind of how I look at it. Because the player of the year should be leading in all these different categories. And when you look at assist, assist is a, basically a team category because that makes the team better. And he led the state in that. You know, that's, that's kind of how I see it. You know? And so that's my take on it. I would give William Deuce Benjamin the player of the year. On Gatorade, I would say clean sweep. Clean sweep. And I would be fine and comfortable with Jose Murillo if he had gotten it. Because I think those two are the ones that are seriously should have been considered. Okay? So I don't know what the Gatorade Player of the Year people were going off of or what they were thinking. Okay? It's something else. To me, to me, it's something else. I don't know what it is. I wasn't in the room. I didn't cast a ballot. So mm, I could sit here and speculate all day long, but it would it wouldn't matter, you know, because I'm not there and I don't have the info to prove it. You see what I'm saying? So that's that's what I'm getting at. Now Another thing I want to argue real quick, I just want to ask this question real quick before I close with this podcast, is why do we got to play at the pit every year? You know, because several coaches have, have talked to me about this, and I've talked to a few, and, and they're all kind of saying the same vibe. They're kind of thinking the same thing, especially the ones outside the metro. They have to travel hundreds of miles if they go to the state championship game at the pit or the state tournament game at the pit they have to sleep at holiday inn or the hampton inn while albuquerque teams get to sleep in their own beds every year all i'm saying is why does it have to be in albuquerque every year why can't we rotate this every two three years pan am center the pit university arena why can't we just rotate this thing I mean, is it fair that all the teams outside the Metro have to travel all the time to the pit? I mean, let's be honest, you know, maybe it'd be nice for the Albuquerque media to get out of Albuquerque for once and cover games outside of the, met the Metro, okay? Because I honestly don't think they're going to be able to or want to give a fair balanced uh, coverage of these other teams outside the Metro. That's just my own opinion on it. But I think it should be. Uh, I think it should be considered. I think I know there's money involved, and I know that's important. And the association, the Mexico Activities Association, needs that money to keep going. And, and likely they got to make the best business decisions. But I think they can be successful in Cruces. I think they can be successful in Albuquerque. I think it's fair to just simply rotate it every couple years. You know, that's how I look at it. I mean, if, if, Farming, if Farmington and Española have to travel to Cruces, I know it's going to be tough. But if Alamogordo and Cruces have to travel to Albuquerque, that's what basically Farmington and those schools have to do going to Cruces. I mean, let's, let's even it out a little bit here. Let's get some fairness going on here. Let's, let's try to, uh, let's try to uh, defray the cost for some areas because some cost... Some schools, a lot of schools outside the metro, especially south, have to travel a long distance. It costs them money. It doesn't cost an Albuquerque school hardly any money at all to go to the pit. You see what I'm getting at? That's where everything needs to be evaluated. That's the whole thing. Let's get some fairness going on here and let's maybe start considering to rotate this thing. The last time a state championship game was played outside of the pit, it was back when I was in high school in 96 in Las Cruces, I believe, in the Pan Am Center. Maybe it would be nice to have a change for once. You know, have the Pan Am Center for two years in a row 
and then uh, the pit for two years in a row, and then the Pan Am Center. And you can do it in football because, let's face it, University Stadium and uh, Aggie Memorial Stadium are about the same size, roughly, and they're about the same quality. And you could do both. You could rotate that, too. That's the thing. Let's, let's even it out a little bit so that we can defray some cost here for some of these schools outside of the state, outside of the metro. And so I, I hope that's considered, talked about, discussed. I'm throwing it out there, you know, talk about it. Talk about it. I think it's great that we even have these facilities. Let's, let's try to use them. Let's try to rotate a little bit. Okay, that's that's what I'm getting at. So with that, uh, you get my take on the state championship game. It was a great game. Uh, you know, congratulations to Jaquan Hill and the Gatorade Player of the Year. And, um, you know, with the whole with the whole thing as far as rotating of, of sites, I hope it gets considered. So I'm going to finish this podcast. I, uh, I'm going to look at more interviews in the future and probably try to start doing these uh, a little shorter and then uh, do some more stuff in the future. And uh, it's exciting this summer and I think we're going to have a great season. So stay tuned for the next podcast in a couple weeks and uh, we'll see what else to talk about. All right. So I thank you for watching and I thank you for playing. You have a great night.